In specific areas, uh, there was some skepticism um, that interstate litigation was likely workable or desirable. Nonetheless, the awareness raising value of such cases was acknowledged if jurisdictional issues could be solved. Litigation against private actors was not likely to be seen on a significant scale in the near future. And given the cross-border nature of climate change, cross-border actions against states by individuals and communities remained more difficult, more problematic. And this is a gap that both environment and human rights advocates um, need to think about addressing. Let me just end by looking at some future areas of potential that were pointed out. The failure to regulate as a, as, as, is perhaps a concept that we should um, identify as a way of holding states accountable. And it may provide a strong basis for future cases, especially in regional um, uh, courts and tribunals. Actions against governments by individuals and communities were generally seen to be the most fruitful avenue, especially, as I say, building on cases such as the Inuit petition to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And then the UN human rights treaty bodies and other mechanisms under the Human Rights Council were seen to have great potential. I don't think I have time to elaborate on that potential, but I think the fact that the Maldives seized the Human Rights Council and got resolutions passed by the governments, members of that council, and supported by a lot of other um, uh, governments meant that all of the uh, treaty bodies and the special rapporteurs on, um, on right to food, right to health, um, housing, all of these suddenly realized or had already realized that this was within their jurisdiction and that they could do um, a lot. So there were several suggestions for how to move forward. There's the task of education to be done with decision makers in all legal fora on the human rights and climate change linkage. Litigators and other victims need to have a coordinated strategy to further share information and develop tools to overcome hurdles. The sharing of information is very important. Some of you may know about a case in Colombia recently where waste pickers were successful in court in stopping a major corporation from uh, getting all the profits from waste picking, which, which in fact was their um, poor livelihood. That case circulated around the world extraordinarily rapidly, and that's the value of being able uh, to take cases in court. So human rights poses a challenge to the climate change re regime. Yeah, I'm actually, all right, I, I, was, I was just going to, um, I was on my last paragraph, but um, uh, I think I'll just, um, in a way, um, end um, uh, from the heart, as I say. Um, there was a time when, if you said um, that uh, human rights were relevant to climate change, people would have said, I don't see the connection. We're way beyond that now, I'm very glad to say. And I believe that the Global Humanitarian Forum, in putting forward principles of climate justice, is probably going to do as much as any other step we will take to bring about a sense of solidarity, that solidarity that was referenced this, this afternoon in tackling this issue. Thank you very much. Mary Robinson. And that was so interesting. I could have continued listening for an hour. I'm so sorry to have interrupted you. Manuel Aranda da Silva has a plane to catch. So I'm going to ask him to come up next. Where are you? There you are. Please come up. Um, he is, of course, Deputy Executive Director of the World Food Programme, but he is going to talk to us about weather index insurance, an important workshop. What has that got to do with food? Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, so I have the privilege to be the chair of a workshop and be the only one in the in that room that didn't know anything about the subject. So, and I have the privilege to report back to you. <laughs> uh, our workshop we divide in two sections. A first section in the morning where we discuss the prospects for development and disaster management of weather index insurance. And the second one in the afternoon that was very interesting on is that sustainable. <laughs> and we have a present on that workshop more, over 30 people from researchers, private sector, uh, different organ international organizations, and was a real good stocking where we are on that. <laughs> a year ago, the major implementers of the index insurance met at the inaugural roundtable at last year's GHF to discuss the promise of index insurance and emerging technology that had shown promise when integrated with broader risk management uh, strategies. Although a complex tool, it is time to move forward in a broader, though cautious manner. More than 10 countries are doing it by now, in different continents, in different ways, and with different results. 
We discussed two types of applications, disaster management, early and reliable resources to governments to aid in more timely response, like is the case in Ethiopia and Caribbean today, and development to enable farmers to have access to financing, as it is the case in Malawi, India, and Nicaragua. While there are several dozen pilots already ongoing, there are only a few examples of index insurance, weather index insurance working at large scale, mainly in India. Insurance works best at large scales because it is designed to spread and pool risks. For example, index insurance in the Caribbean premiums uh, are 30% less than it would be for an individual country. Through development of these markets, it has increased access to financial service. The question was whether index insurance can fulfill its promise to reduce poverty at large scale in a sustainable manner. Out of an inaugural GHF, it was decided that uh, what we need to do was a stock taking, a collective getting together the different experience of index insurance implementers, researchers, private sector, donors, NGOs, and humanitarian agencies. This is now being pulled together into this publication that I recommend you to read. If you don't understand what it is, it's simple. It's just bring insurance to those who have no access to insurance. Uh, and how we do it? We do it in a way that is not individual, that is simple and is transparent. And this has been launched, this book, in, during this event here. Mm -hmm. The report looks to specific challenges and opportunities to, of index in, insurance. In today's discussion, we look specific at this challenge and the su sustainability of insurance. We discuss the role of index insurance as an important adaptation mechanism and agreed that index insurance can act as an adaptation mechanism by transferring and reducing risks. We had three recommendations, mainly. The first one is it's about time to move and scale up this tool. In order to do that, we should be based on demand from farmers, mainly, and the solutions need to produce tangible benefits for farmers in a sustainable way. And that is possible, as is already demonstrated in some of the pilots. We need to have, we also trace that there are some constraints in some areas of the world. We need to have gl global public goods to make these markets to work. And one of them is weather data and weather stations. And we discussed this yesterday, how we have a project to move that very fast, particularly in Africa, where this is a big constraint. And finally, we recommended that we, we need to get together in a regular manner, in an informal manner, with a broader network than the specialists and get this to the ground as fast as possible. Thank you very much.